I think we should get started. Um, as you may be aware, this particular conference uh, has the benefit of simultaneous translation. So um, our, our colleagues at the back, you see, will be responsible for translating uh, well, the presentations from English to Mandarin and vice versa. So um, with this, I'm delighted to, first of all, uh, introduce my co-director. My name is Calvin Ho, in case you uh, are not already aware. Uh, I am one of the co-directors of the Center for Medical Ethics and Law. Uh, this is, as you know, uh, a center that's jointly run by the law school and the medical school. So um, I am essentially the representative from the law school side. And uh, with me, of course, is Professor Gilberto Leung uh, from the medical school. Professor Leung is also um, very distinguished, distinguished in many ways, holding very important positions, including being the president of the Hong Kong Academy of Medicine. So uh, let me start off by inviting uh, Professor Leung to say a few words, uh, just welcome remarks. Uh, and then I'll, I'll start off with a, a short presentation, a bit about the conference and the conference structure. Uh, and at um, 10.30, we'll be joined via Zoom by uh, Professor Tuan. So Professor Tuan is with us already. Uh, he will be presenting in Mandarin. So for those who are not familiar with the language, we do have headsets. Uh, you, you should see them uh, up front. If you haven't gotten one already, please do help yourself to one of the headsets. Uh, so that will... Uh, follow from 10.30 shortly. But in the meantime, Professor Leung, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gilberto Leung. I'm a clinician by training. Uh, I'm from the Faculty of Medicine. And the first thing to say is that try not to believe everything that Kelvin tells you, especially about me. Uh, while I'm a co-director with him for CMAP, he's actually the boss. He does all the work. He pulled everyone together and uh, formulated this wonderful program, which I'm sure you enjoy in the coming two to three days. Um, but I, I wear uh, two hats. Uh, I am the associate dean of my faculty. I also look after postgraduate training in Hong Kong, i.e. all uh, medical specialist training. And we all, while we're all very excited about the uh, development of artificial intelligence, uh, and we uh, anticipate a lot of benefits uh, from such developments, we are also very cognizant of the various um, issues that AI can bring to the profession as well as the community, our patients, um, their rights, and uh, how uh, important it is. Um, the government and legal experts uh, have to face up to all the challenges that we are likely to face uh, in the coming years, if not decades. So I'm really grateful that uh, Kelvin had um, uh, put together this wonderful program. Uh, I don't think we will get to any definitive answer by the end of this conference, but I'm sure the discussion um, and exchange would be uh, extremely fruitful uh, for us to move forward. So with that, uh, Kevin, would you like to describe the wonderful program that um, you put together for us? Thank you. Thanks so much, Professor Leong. I'm switching over to this side because um, I do have some slides uh, to share, and that will be broadly speaking to a number of themes that I hope we will be able to address uh, at this particular meeting. So if you bear with me, I'm just going to get the presentation material up. So here it is. So first of all, um, I should start off with the acknowledgements. Um, I'd very much like to thank our supporting organizations. That would be the HKU Clinical Trial Center, uh, HKU Medical Ethics and Humanities Unit, uh, as well as the Hong Kong Academy of Medicine. Uh, we're grateful for all their support, their help in public, uh, publicity, but also in terms of ongoing work. Uh, one of the hopes that we have for this particular meeting is to uh, subsequently develop ethical and perhaps regulatory guardrails uh, where they apply to the development as well as implementation of medical AI. Uh, so I'm very grateful to uh, the law school for allowing us to use this beautiful venue uh, and also to Dr. Yang Ling for uh, the very generous assistance in publicizing this particular conference to our colleagues, particularly on the mainland. 
Um, we are extremely grateful to our donors. Uh, so the Wing Foundation, our donor has been very supportive. Um, and, um, and also our grantor, the Research Grant Council of Hong Kong, delighted to say that uh, part of this meeting is linked to uh, a, a general research fund uh, on the development of medical AI in the Greater Bay Area. I'm also happy to say that a number of uh, my collaborators are here in the audience, um, including, of course, my very esteemed uh, co-chair and co-director, Professor Leung. So uh, warm welcome to all colleagues who are involved in this project. Uh, we are uh, especially grateful to our board member, Ms. Anna Wu, who is in the audience. Thank you so much, Anna, for your generous support. We are extremely grateful for all your help and guidance. Thank you again. Um, to uh, my longtime collaborator, Carl, for his help with the uh, program, uh, as well as the timetabling, um, uh, joining us today, of course, from Singapore. Uh, my team uh, here at the law school, uh, Jane, whom you've just heard from, and also Candy, who has been wonderful in uh, getting all the logistics as well as travel arrangements together. And finally, of course, all our speakers, discussants and participants. Of course, this particular meeting would not mean anything without your generous contribution. So thank you so much in advance, and I very much look forward to the discussions in the next couple of days. Uh, there'll be a number of our other colleagues who will be joining us, as you know. Uh, a, a number of these sessions will be uh, live-streamed um, and uh, also uh, recorded. Uh, the live-stream aspect, of course, will uh, already, would have already just been st uh, started from 10 o'clock the, the, uh, this very morning right through to 3.15. So uh, we haven't for uh, environmental friendly reasons, um, not printed the program, but if you'd like to have a look at the program and timetable, they may be downloaded from our website. And as you see, from now until 3.15, all the sessions will be streamed. Um, but from 3.15 onwards, we'll be joined by uh, a, a few of the startups uh, that are responsible for or very much involved in developing medical AI devices. Uh, from that time onwards, that would be essentially an in-person event. So uh, so my apologies to those who are with us uh, on the live stream, because that particular segment of the discussion will, will not be uh, available to you. But that said, you're welcome to join us tomorrow morning, because there'll be a summary of the discussions then. And of course, there will be, following this particular conference, proceedings written up. So you're welcome to review that. Um, so it's it's quite a, a rich discussion, I'd say, that they would have, as well as programs. So I very much look forward to everyone's thoughts and contributions. Um, so moving along. Um, okay. In the interest of time, I'll just... Um, Highlight all the key aspects. I mean, it's it's, it's the usual kind of um, uh, features that you'd find in any sort of discussion. So we we do have uh, a specific context in mind, and of course, that's the Greater Bay Area. So quite a few of the discussion will try to link back to developments within the Greater Bay Area. So of course, that would essentially be uh, the uh, the uh, association that you'd find uh, among three key jurisdictions, being uh, Hong Kong SAR. Uh, Macau SAR and of course uh, the uh, province of Guangdong uh, in, in mainland China. So we want to look into some of the specific developments, but I think it's interesting also because you'd find uh, the interaction of three different jurisdictions, three different regimes okay. and practices, and uh, they are likely to have significant impact in thinking about how developments in medical AI should follow. We are, of course, talking about uh, the development and use of medical AI, this being the broad theme, and some of the related considerations in data governance. So, of course, that would be the collection and use of uh, personal data. Uh, would, uh, in some of our sessions, be focused on specific types of data, for example, genomic data. So that's in day two of this particular conference, and then electronic health records. Uh, as we will hear from one of our presenters on day three. Um, 
Well, we're looking at a range of developments, but uh, I'm going to elaborate on each of these points subsequently. So here's a broad overview, but let me, in the, again, in the interest of time, get into the details. Okay, so it is moving forward very quickly. Uh, this is the context. If you're not already familiar, so that would be the Greater Bay Area. It has huge economic significance, of course, if you look at this. And if you think about the economic uh, implications of medical devices development, right? So you'd see it's a uh, estimated to be by 2027, a US 585 billion uh, dollars market. So huge market in this particular space. But of course, there are uh, important ethical and regulatory considerations if we are to think about the diffusion and, of course, subsequent adoption of these particular technological developments. But start, starting to look first uh, on uh, at the situation on mainland China, as you see, um, from 2017, a regulatory science action plan has been uh, issued or launched by the National Medical Products Administration. So that is the key regulatory agency in um, in China for medical uh, AI devices. Uh, and importantly, of course, following a number of revisions, we've got uh, Order 739, the most recent uh, set of regulations that apply to medical devices. So what we see essentially would be an adaptation of a regime that's been developed for, uh, well, uh, a, a rather impolite reference would be unintelligent devices uh, f and, and expand it essentially to attempt to cover what we understand to be smart devices. Of course, smart simply means uh, being linked up to the internet. But of course, as we see, right, there'd be uh, quite a number of other features that would be linked to these developments. Uh, time permitting, we just want to look at uh, a number of um, policy development, so uh, as well as developments in terms of practices. So one of the important ones would be uh, a set of review guidelines issued by the Center for Medical Device Evaluation of the uh, National Medical Products Administration, consolidating a, 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 a set of, in fact, a series of considerations that would apply to the development of medical AI. So, so that's uh, one important aspect that we want to consider. Um, I thought for further information, um, and, and for those who are interested, uh, I've contributed to a, a chapter to uh, an edited monograph uh, by uh, Professor Barry Suleiman, who's with us in the audience, uh, and Professor Glenn Cohen. So very much looking forward to hearing more about this work, which we will on day two during the public symposium. So quite apart from um, looking ahead in terms of regulatory and policy developments, we are, we are also gathered here to celebrate some of these important uh, academic achievements, including the edited volume that we'll hear uh, Barry speak to us about uh, tomorrow. So as a broad overview, and I think many in the audience would already know, we find that there are a number of uh, important regulatory characteristics. So uh, there is already in place a listing or registration system for regulatory control and accountability. Of course, this has been instituted, as I've mentioned earlier, for uh, well, a range of medical devices from, from very unsophisticated band-aids right through to near autonomous uh, AI-based medical devices. So all of this would fit within that particular regime. And within this medical device framework, uh, as we all appreciate, is essentially a risk-based system. So you would have of course, very simple requirements for class one, at least on mainland China, that would be considered low risk device. Uh, two, of course, class three will be a uh, high risk sophisticated devices. Um, and there has been a number of important policies as well as regulatory provisions relating to clinical evaluation, because as far as the regulatory system is concerned, we find that regulators are primarily concerned with the safety and effectiveness of device. So questions about evidence, questions about trash hole becomes very important considerations. And there we find that there are important differences among the various jurisdictions. Of course, in this particular meeting, we will focus on three major markets, so to speak, involving three key regulators. Of course, the National Medical Products Administration will speak to developments uh, in the Chinese market. And we want to compare these developments with uh, with those that are happening in Europe, 
course, the uh, European Medicines Agency being the key regulator, and of course, uh, in North America, uh, in, in the US specifically, we have the US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. So we're going to take a comparative look at some of these provisions, and they speak to the sort of evidence that's required. And what you'd find is that um, aside from clinical trials, of course, that would have been the gold standard approach to evidence generation, there is growing reliance on real world data uh, and the application of such information uh, for well, evaluative purposes. So um, that is linked to yet another feature that we find for uh, medical products. Of course, that would be um, the total product life cycle approach. So we'll, we'll speak more about this. And on mainland China, of course, one important initiative would be the use or development of unique device identifiers for this particular purpose. And finally, um, we we see a, a change in regulatory mindset, at least in these major jurisdictions, as well, I'd like to think. Uh, it's a lot more collaborative rather than a one-time top-down kind of approach. Uh, and what's... Um, I, I thought very interesting in the, uh, the the regulations that we find on mainland China is an explicit reference to a participatory governance kind of approach across the whole of society. So, um, so this, uh, of course, for those who are familiar with Chinese, this is the the term that's that's used. I, I welcome discussion as as to whether you think my translation or my understanding of this particular term is appropriate or not. Uh, so. So uh, it'll be interesting to get your thoughts on that. So thank you very much in advance for that too. In Hong Kong, of course, uh, quite different in the sense that there isn't a specific legislation that speaks to, to medical devices in general, uh, and, and certainly nothing that's specific to medical AI. But uh, what we find here, of course, is a commitment by the Department of Health that there will be legislation to follow. So it's essentially work in progress. So um, while, while this is broadly the arrangement, uh, we have a colleague from Macau who will be speaking to some of the provisions there. But my understanding is that's not very different from the situation here in Hong Kong. Uh, I, I wanted to highlight with this slide that quite apart from concerns with safety and effectiveness, regulators are also concern about access. So they want to try to ensure that access uh, is there for patients who might need or benefit from these devices. So it becomes a, a very intricate balancing act when you may not have gold standard evidence as to safety and effectiveness of a device, but at the same time, the need is quite clear uh, for some of these devices, perhaps not very different from what we see with uh, pharmaceutical products, or otherwise advanced therapy products, a range of them. Uh, but of course, what's different is that in Hong Kong, just for uh, comparison purposes, right, we do have recently introduced new provisions that will apply to advanced therapy products, and we expect similar developments to follow for uh, medical devices and medical AI devices in particular. So, um, so that's a space to watch. The data governance landscape is complex, as we will hear from our uh, mainland colleagues shortly. So you see that uh, on mainland China, uh, there are quite a few different provisions that speak to data governance. So uh, these would be uh, a set of them. And what's interesting is that if you contrast that with Hong Kong, so not too much, uh, we, we do have some provisions, but essentially, of course, we have the personal data privacy ordinance. So um, some of the key principles in data protection, I think uh, those in the audience will already be familiar with, but you'd find that this is not very different from the Data Protection Act in the UK, for example, that has since been replaced by the U UK version of the GDPR. Uh, that we will hear from Dr. Mitchell uh, uh, on day two, actually. So Dr. Mitchell has very kindly agreed to provide us with a few presentations. So that will be one of the presentations. So thanks again, Colin, in advance. So in Hong Kong, we also have specific provisions on electronic health records. So a set of principles there. But what I'm hoping to highlight is that there you'd see a mix of different principles as well as regulatory provisions. And whether they all sit well together is one of the key questions that we want to take on uh, today um, and over the next few days. 
And when we think about the when all of these developments are happening, you see, of course, there is a push on the technology front from general AI to deep learning. And this is consistent with, if you look on, on the chart, right, how the, the internet, the, the, the World Wide Web itself is evolving. So starting from Web 1.0, essentially concerned with information retrieval to where we're at right now, if we think about the internet of things and the architecture that's associated with, uh, associated with IoT. So that's Web 3.0. So we're pushing now very strongly towards Web 4.0, where we will have relatively autonomous uh, devices as well as um, entities like, of course, the autonomous, uh, the, the, the driverless car, of course, that being um, an exemplar of developments on this front. So we see similar kind of changes in, in the healthcare or medical sector. And, um, and where data is concerned within health, of course, you'd see uh, from Eric Topol's very helpful review, right? Um, uh, a huge diversity of information coming on. And this would just be essentially within a clinical setting, leaving aside, of course, uh, quite a lot of the wearables that we have now uh, that will be able to generate uh, data as well as with edge computing, right? With some of these devices, process the data within the devices before remitting the signal up to a cloud platform, for example. So, um, so, Taking into account all of these considerations, safety, um, effectiveness, access, we want to try to link it up to some of the discussions. And this, of course, is one model that we could consider. Uh, that is Everett Rogers' um, theory of diffusion. So um, according to this theory, some of you may be familiar with already, it speaks to when technology is likely to be adopted and what might be some of the barriers to adoption. Uh, and what's interesting about this particular approach, I would argue, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this subsequently, is that there are very clear ethical as well as legal determinants, uh, so to speak, to innovation and adoption. So when we think about the role of ethics committees, for example, they are essentially concerned with the uh, well-being of, uh, of human subjects or human participants. But at the same time, it's also the responsibility of ethics committee to, to foster responsible research. So they have got this balancing role that they, they need to perform. Similarly for regulators, as I've already mentioned, they are concerned with safety and effectiveness. But at the same time, they want to ensure that there is appropriate access by patients who might need the device or the intervention. So all of these speak to the different attributes of innovation. And so when we think from a sociological standpoint and its social impact, I think it will be helpful to try to draw these various fragments together and to see how they are able to better speak to each other in a way that could promote access and, and support uh, innovation. So where we're headed, uh, we are attempting to push very strongly to a truly participatory learning healthcare system. I think this, uh, again, is no surprise to many in, in the audience. Um, and, and here broadly, I think from the systematic review, right, would be a helpful summation of the clinical applications we see with medical AI. Uh, with Carl, we have uh, written up an illustration and I think that uh, might uh, perhaps if useful, be taken up during the round table, round table discussion because some of our uh, uh, startup colleagues will be speaking to similar kinds of developments that we see in Hong Kong. So how to get there? Uh, we do need to think about the regulatory governance mindset because I would argue that there has been uh, important changes uh, that is largely linked to the nature of device themselves uh, and, and the nature of AI work, we do need to think about the relationship between regulatory regimes on the one hand and ethical mechanisms on the other, because I'm not sure that they uh, are necessarily speaking to each other in a, an in a appropriate manner, or in, in an effective manner, I suppose. Appropriate would not be the right word. By effective, I mean in a way that would um, advance the collective good, ensure the protection of uh, human participants, uh, and also at the same time, advancing 
responsible innovation. So um, it's a complicated landscape. And here I've just put out um, at least three, broadly speaking, registers that we could consider. Of course, that pertaining to the software aspects. So that would be the computational aspects uh, of the device, uh, the data aspects. And then finally, when, when we think about its use within uh, a healthcare environment, right, the professional or the civic aspects. Uh, so if we look at some of the developments around the world, of course, this uh, in North America and in the UK, right, there have already been some principles that will apply to our web 4.0 contacts, because this was issued in 2021. Uh, we do have relatively similar provisions in the uh, 2022, the uh, regulatory review guidelines that was issued by the Center for Medical Device Evaluation on mainland China, but also some very important differences. Uh, time permitting, we can look into some of these differences. But in Hong Kong, uh, looking at data, we do have ethical principles uh, set out in terms of data use uh, and also good data stewardship. Of course, we should consider this with a number of other values that have been set out this by the World Health Organization, uh, that is to broaden the framework even further from what will be local to uh, a global scale. But my point in illustrating all of these values and principles is to say that we are not short of them. So as you see, we have got a degree of agreement in terms of the principles that would apply. But what we are to do with this principle, I think is the important question that needs to be taken on. And I do hope that from this particular meeting, we will be able to respond to them. Uh, and this is essentially a paper some of you may have seen uh, by some of our colleagues and uh, published in the American Journal of Bioethics, speaking uh, from a device standpoint, some of the uh, ethical considerations there you see the ethical principles being set out uh, at the uh, last gray column that says ethical considerations. So who's responsible? Um, it's a difficult question given the fluidity of the context, given uh, the, the way that um, the rela relationships are being forged around these particular devices. So what you find is a, a more dy dynamic form of association. So it could be device link, it could be uh, relationships uh, that, that may be contextual in nature, or it could be uh, linked to, to organizations or systems. Uh, there are considerations of data sovereignty, uh, our colleague Patrick Hummel and, and others have, have written about this, and I hope that this is something that we could perhaps discuss in day two. Uh, and finally, looking at what, again, our privacy commissioner has provided for, um, we might want to consider if human in the loop, of course, broadly accepted as an arrangement for AI development, right, really could address the sort of challenges that would come with Web 4.0 and relatively autonomous uh, medical devices. So uh, the conference structure uh, is essentially um, what you see on this slide. I've highlighted a number of questions that we could take on for each day. Uh, we are starting today, of course, with day one, looking at the regulatory governance of medical AI. So this would, broadly speaking, be the computational aspect that's linked to the device. It could be software as medical device or otherwise software in a medical device. Uh, day two, we will want to look more into the data governance aspect. And then finally, for day three, thinking about what collaboration and participation would mean as a matter of practice. So um, thank you so much. I'm sorry to run slightly over time, but uh, I take this opportunity to thank everyone again and to wish all a very successful conference ahead. So with this, I'd um, um, like to welcome back my co-director, Professor Leung, who will introduce our very distinguished keynote speaker, uh, Professor Duan, Duan Jiao So, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Leung, over to you to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much, Kelvin, for giving us the contest. Uh, you refer to the Greater Bay Area um, and mainland China, and we are indeed very privileged to have Professor Duang Weiwen um, to deliver the keynote address on China's AI regulatory system. <laughs> Professor Duan is Doctoral Supervisor at the University of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and he's a very special um, allowance expert of the State Council of China. <clears throat> he has been a visiting scholar um, at Oxford, 
Colorado, Pittsburgh, and his main research areas are in philosophy of science and technology, ethics of science, technology, social and ethical issues of ICT, big data, and AI above all. Uh, he is the chief researcher of philosophical studies on intelligence and revolution and deepening techno scientific of human being um, from 2017 to 2022, which was supported by the National Social Sciences Founding of China. So uh, he's obviously a very proliferative uh, author, and he is one of the deputy chairman of the Committee of Big Data Experts of China. Uh, so he's very well qualified and well placed to uh, speak to us about, as I mentioned, China's AI regulatory system and the prospects of ethical governance of medical AI. I believe Professor Duang is online already. Uh, Professor Wang, good morning. Uh, ni hao. Oh, 大家好. 我是这个中国社会科学院哲学所的段伟文。当然,I uh, uh, should speak in English, however, uh, the, there are lots of government documents. I think maybe it's uh, need a, a long time for me. Uh, 对这样一个人工智能的这样一个相关的伦理和治理的这样一个原则规范和标准的话 那么根据我的这样一个印象，啊，最开始的时候，呃，它是由呃I呃Triple E 当然在这里面有很多的这样一些规范那么这些规范的话呢这些表明在我们这个人工智能的这样一个治理或者是伦理的这样一个规制也好法律的这个规范也好它实际上并没有一个统一的架构而是随着这样一个时间的这样一个先
呃，这样一些个，我想呃，跟国际上的啊、呃、一些个呃规范啊都非常接近的啊这样一些内容。但是呢，我值得呃指出的是，中国的这个新一代伦理啊、呃、规范啊，呃，他呃呃，他实际上非常强调这个责任主体啊。那么呃，新一代的这样一个人工智能伦理规范这里面呢，因为它是从国家层面来制定的啊，所以它。呃，特别强调了管理主体啊，把管理主体啊放在前面啊，管理主体啊，这就包括呃相关的这样一个呃伦理审查啊、审计监督啊、政策制定、战略规划等等啊。那么另外的呃几个主体就是研发主体啊，就是研究和开发的这个主体，还有供应主体啊、使用主体啊。那我们都知道，呃，人工智能它实际上在社会上的这样一个安全和伦理风险。啊，很重要的就是这个呃供应和部署啊，就是呃谁来提供这样一个技术，然后谁来部署这样一个技术。比方在人脸识别的这样一个应用中啊，其实就有很多啊这样一些个非常具体的问题。所以新一代人工智能伦理规范啊，明确了这样一个责任主体啊，实际上呢，就从这样一个一般性的伦理原则啊，就走到了啊更具体的这样一个问责的这样一种可能性。那么，呃，我想从这样一个数字产业层面啊，数字技术、网络产业层面啊，更有权威性的啊，一个呃实践指南啊，那就是呃网络安全标准实践指南中的人工智能伦理安全风险防范指引啊。那么在这个里面，我们可以看到啊，它比方说这个 C 啊，它特别强调了尊重并保护个人基本权利。人身、隐私、财产等权利啊，特别注意保护弱势群体啊。那么，所以这里面啊，隐私权和用户权利啊，都得到了凸显。然后还强调啊，在 D 的这个部分还强调，应该充分认识、全面分析人工智能的安全风险，在合理范围内啊开展活动啊。那么，作为啊中国的这样一种啊啊。这个对于数字企业、数字产业的这样一个治理的这样一个呃实践标准啊、呃、标准实践指南的话啊，它也它呃强调了这样一个呃相关主体要推动治理体系的这个建设啊。那么这个体呃还有这个相关主体应该推动治理体系的宣传啊。那么这个呢啊，它实际上都是从国家层面啊，它的这样一种啊治理文化。对他的呃，就是在这儿就已经渗透到这个里面来了，是吧？呃，那么在这样一个标准里面，同样的啊，他也提出了四大责任主体啊。当然，在这个主在这几个主体里面，主要包括研究开发者啊、设计制造者、部署应用者以及用户。所以我们可以看到啊，这两个规范它的呃，就它这个和前面这个新一代人工智能的伦理规范有一点不一样啊，他们的这样一个呃责任主体是不太一样的啊。所以，我们这里可我们这里可以看到啊，由不同的部门啊、不同的机构啊来制定的这个伦理规范，他们有不一样的考虑啊。所以呢，就是我刚才说的，我们并没有一个统一的架构啊，因为这个都不可能通过一种演绎啊，呃，通过一种逻辑上的演绎啊来啊推演出一个什么样的架构，而都是随着这样一个呃创新或者实践的发展啊往前推进的。好，呃，当然，呃，产业部门啊、呃，他们也做了很多工作啊，比方说工信部的信通院啊，那么信息通信研究院可能是啊，呃，他们呃跟这个京东啊合作啊，这个研究了可信的人工智能的框架，啊、并且呢，呃，在人脸识别这些啊非常有争议的啊这样一些个活动里面啊，他们呃是呃呃不仅进行了这样一种评估和培训。啊，而且呢，还这个推动了啊一种所所谓的互联运动啊，意思就是说要保护消费者的这样一个脸部啊这样一些个敏感的啊生物特征信息的啊这样一个活动啊这样一个行动也好，是吧？啊，那么这是啊从啊产业部门，因为产业部门他还是想啊通过这样一些个啊可信的人工智能框架以及像人脸识别的啊这样一些个规范和标准啊以及它的实践。啊，来这个呃规避啊，来减少这样一个安全和伦理上的风险啊，来推动这个人工智能本身的发展啊。比方说啊，在上海啊，这个呃这个信通院的华东分院啊，他们就啊推动了上海的地方的
人脸识别的这样一个标准啊。那么目前呢，呃，这个草案已经出来了啊，在征求意见啊，或者是已经征求完意见了啊。那么这些呢，我也都是啊参与到这个里面啊。同时呢，呃，上海他们还金信委那边他们还呃也也包括深圳啊，他们从产业促进法的角度。啊，来提呃，在这个产业促进法、人工智能产业促进法、人工智能促进法这个架构下啊，来讨论啊，人工智能的伦理的呃治理和审呃这个呃审查等等。好，那么呃，另外呢，就是最近啊，实际上呃，这个国家人工智能标准化总呃标准化总体组啊，还有国家信标委、人工智能分委会啊，他们实际上是在。2017年啊，那个时候呢，他们就呃，因为这个 I T R P E 啊，他们在中国来啊推销啊，或者是啊推动啊相关的这样一个智能化自动系统的伦理标准的时候呢，哎，那么中国的这样一个啊人工智能呃、啊、也也国家也成立了人人工智能标准化总体组啊，那么这个工作持续了很多年啊，那么最近啊。就颁布出来了啊，那么我们可以看到，呃，在这个架构里面，它对照了这个国家科技伦理委员会的这样一个，呃呃，以及这个两办意见里面啊，就是中办国办意见里面关于加强科技伦理治理意见里面的科技伦理原则啊，他们呃。自身啊，他们是制定了这样一系列的伦理原则啊，比方说啊，以人为本啊，可持续性、合作、隐私、公平啊、共享、外部安全、内部安全、透明、可问责等等啊。好，那么呃，他们同时还呃，这个对人工智能伦理风险的这样一个分类和识别啊，做了一个这样一个分析的这个矩阵啊，我们可以看到，在这个里面依然它还是凸显了这样一个责任主体啊，比方说技术主体、管理主体啊、应用主体等等。那我想这个从理论上来讲啊，就是在技术伦理研究里面的这个伦理矩阵矩阵的这个方法啊，在这就用上了。那么其中啊，我简单说一下啊，呃，涉及到呃医疗人工智能或者是智能医疗啊，在这样一个呃产业部门的这样一个话语里面啊，这样一个叙事方式里面，他是把它叫做一种场景啊，他就认为在智能医疗场景里面啊，它会有三类的伦理风险啊，第一类呢就是技术型的伦理风险啊，技术型的伦理风险的话呢，啊，比方说啊，手术机器人。和智能医学影像分析中啊，涉及到的啊这样一些个问题啊，这样一些个伦理风险啊。那么第二类就是叫应用型的伦理风险啊。那么这个应用型的伦理风险呢啊，比方说脑机接口啊，呃，这样还有可穿戴设备，还有这个医疗信息平台对于隐私共享啊，以及伦理准则的影响等等啊，这是第二类。那么第三类就是混合型的这样一个伦理风险。啊，那么这个混合型的伦理风险就是包括人工智能驱动的人类增强啊，应对主动安全和被动安全的啊这样一些个准则的影响啊，特别是脑机接口啊，然后这个脑机接口它有可能遭遇到比方说黑客的攻击啊，或者是数据窃取等等。我们从这里可以看到啊，中国国内的啊这样一些个对于人工智能的、啊、或者是医疗人工智能的这个伦理研究啊，它还是比较前沿的啊，甚至有很多的这个科技。它并没有真正的完这个实施啊，或者仅仅还是在实验阶段，但是呢啊，已经有这方面的这样一个讨论了啊，而且从这样一个思考上呢，它有很多是属于工程性的啊这样一个啊呃思考的这样一个方式啊，比方说在这里面它会强调可控性、可靠性啊、鲁棒性啊，就是 robust 啊呃这这样一些东西啊。呃，好，这是呃第一个方面。第二个方面，我简单说一下当前科技伦理治理的总体态势啊。那么大概是在去年的呃年初啊，就是当然也经过了一年多的这个酝酿啊，这个中呃中办和国办啊颁布了这个关于加强科技伦理治理的意见。那么其中提出了啊一系列的伦理原则啊。那么这些伦理原则我们可以看到和呃新一代人工智能伦理规范也是啊有非常接近的地方啊。这里面包括，比方说，增进人类福祉、增进生命权利、坚持公平公正啊、合理控制风险啊、保持公开透明等等啊。那么，呃，这里面它有一些个治理要求啊，治理要求里面特别谈到了伦理先行啊。那么伦为什么要伦理先行呢？大概意思就是在讲啊，中国以前的这样一个发展都是跟着。美国啊，或者是跟着先进国家，那么现在呢？因为中国自身已经进入到科技的这个无人区了啊，所以呢啊，那么伦理
先行啊，就是要把伦理放在一个啊优先事项来考虑啊，就非常重要了啊。那么其他几条啊，也都是我们刚才都见到的，比方依法依规、敏捷治理、立立足国情啊、开放合作啊。同时呢，这里面啊，值得指出的就是我们啊制定了啊。一系列的这样一个科技伦理原则，我想这些科技科技伦理原则基本上是符合国际上啊对于科技伦科技的这样一个价值的认知的啊。比方说这里面啊，增进人类福祉啊，第二条尊重生命权利。那我想这一条呢，就是呃，如果大家感兴趣啊，一定要去呃认真看一下啊。我在这儿呢，因为时间啊，就不特别啊去讲了啊。但是这一条，我想是对于啊医疗或者是医疗人工智能，我想是最重要的一条啊。啊，后面的这个坚持公平公正啊，合理控制风险啊，保持公开透明，我们可以看到它基本上跟国际上的啊这样一些个伦理原则啊，都是有很大的这个契合度啊，也包括联合国啊推出的这个相关的人工智能伦理建议书啊里面的这样一些个规范啊。那么，呃，另外一个事情就是，大概是在啊一八年啊，基因编辑事件之后啊，那么呃就促成了这样一个国家科技伦理委员会的建立啊。那么在二零年的时候呢，啊就成立了这个生命啊医学分委会、生命科学分委会和人工智能啊三个分委会。而目前呢，这个中国科协啊正在啊组建啊这个或者是筹建啊。中国科技伦理学会啊，这是啊这么一个情况。那么就是说，要加强这个方面的这个研究啊。那么这里面啊有很多内容，我只讲呃，我只讲一个很重要的呃方面，那就是国家科技伦理委员会啊这几个分委会他们做的一个最重要的啊，或者是第一项工作，就是制定科技伦理高风险科技活动的清单啊。那么这个呢，就是根据这样一个。这个加强科技伦理审查的意见啊，就是要求制定这样一个清单，并且对这个清单的审查，就是列到这样一些清单里面的这样一些科技活动，不仅要通过一般的伦理审查，而且它的伦理审查的结果还要通过专家进行复核啊，这是非常重要的啊。好，那么呃，下面只简单讲一下我们目前啊关于伦理审查，它有两种办法，但是这两种办法呢，呃，它之间存在着一定的张力啊。啊，看他怎么协同啊。那么目前来看的话啊，已经颁布的啊，就是啊，涉及人的生命科学和医学研究的伦理审查办法啊。那么这个伦理审查办法啊，虽然是啊由卫健委来颁布的，但是实际上呢，也是纳入到了国家科技伦理委员会的这个架构之下啊。那么与此同时呢，啊，科技部啊也颁布了啊这样一个呃、啊、科技伦理审查办法的试行稿，并且呢还在征求意见之中啊，这是啊这样一个内容。那么这两个内容，我觉得大家可以关注一下，一个是科技活动的伦理要求啊，呃，那么另外一个就是说啊涉及医学和生命科学的这样一个。医学研究的伦理原则和基本要求呢？这个里面呢，它已经这个是已经公开颁布了的啊。那么我们可以看到，它所遵循的原则啊，与生命伦理学的四原则是非常接近的啊。比方说，它要遵循有益不伤害公正的原则啊。那么它在另外一条里面特别凸显了啊，说要遵循国际公认的伦理准则啊。这个我想，呃，这个是呃，它它的这样一个基本的含义，我们应该能够理解了啊。那么当然，呃，这两种审查办法它有它的这样一个适用范围啊。那么其实科技伦理审查办法里面，其实更多的啊，主要的还是涉及到人啊，呃，涉及到实验动物啊，这样这样一些个呃研究啊。但是其他的方面呢，它可能会涉及到一些个啊具有挑战性的啊，或者是颠覆性的啊这样一些个科技啊，呃。那么这里面就是科技伦理审查办法里面啊，是是呃是适合的这个，我们可以看到，就这个我们就不多说了啊。呃，那么这里面就是啊，在这个啊涉及人的生命科学和医学研究伦理审查办法里面，以及啊科技伦理审查办法征求意见稿的这个试行征求意见稿这个里面，就是将啊国家科技伦理委员会。这几个分委会啊，或者是国家科技伦理会，他们所研究和理呃制定的这样一些个伦理高风险科技活动清单这样一个制度啊，就把它要落实在这两个办法里面啊。那么这个落实这个办法，就是要有一个复核啊的方式啊，就是强调这个啊。
。那么这个里面就有一个专家复合的啊，在这个呃科技伦理审查办法试行稿里面啊，就列出了若干啊需要专家复合的啊科技活动啊的清单。那么这个实际上就是啊，或者是在很大程度上参考了啊。国家科技伦理委员会几个分委会啊，他们制定的这样一个高峰清单，并且这样一些个清单要根据科技创新的发展啊进行动态的调整啊。这里面啊涉及到，比方说跟人工智能有关的啊，那里面就有，比方第四条啊，侵入式脑机接口用于神经啊、精神类啊、疾病类的治疗的临床研究啊。的这样一些个呃内容啊，我想这些个内容呢，里面将来应该越来越多的啊，跟医疗人工智能有关啊。那么最后啊，我就简单说一下啊，医学人工智能或者是医疗人工智能的伦理治理的展望啊。那么就我们现在来看啊，前面两种办法他们在实施里面啊，它是有一个协同的问题。那么这个协同问题里面呢，就是说在中国来看的话。还是涉及人的生命医学和呃生命科学和医学研究的伦理审查，他们在实践上和理论上具有相对的先进性啊。那也就是说，我们将来的医学人工智能的这样一个伦理审查啊，就是要和科技伦理审查结合起来啊。那么这个里面呢，就是它还有一个延续性啊，同时它要借鉴啊我们现有的啊生命医学伦理审查啊。那么。第三点呢，就是说这个防范高风险的这样一个科技活动啊，那么这个里面啊，在两种审查办法里面啊，那么将来你怎么样去做好接口，怎么做做好衔接啊，这是很重要的啊。那么再就是第四个，就是相称性原则啊，这个相称性原则，其实一旦国家要推动这样一个普遍的科技伦理审查，它就必须要使得。那些非常重要的关键的问题得到审查，那、啊、要呃，这里面会涉及到资源和经费的这样一个使用啊。那么其他还有互操作啊，呃，还有其他一些东西啊，我就不多说了啊。但这里面其实很重要的就是呃，在以医疗人工智能为例，那么将来因为它是一个呃跨呃跨学科的跨领域的啊这样一种呃问题，那么将来它可能需要啊相关的生命医学伦理以及。其他的这样一个呃国家的地方的科技伦理委员会，它互相要有一个风伦理风险的通报啊，或者是重要事项的沟通的机制啊。那么下面呢，因为我是一个呃科学哲学家啊，我呢需要呃我当然我也参与了很多的实践啊，那就是我根据我在实践中的这样一些一个思考啊。就是呃，我也参加了国家的这个数字治理啊，包括一些平台企业啊，包括呃蚂蚁啊，包括这个美团呐啊,啊，这这样一些个啊，他们的这个伦理治理的工作，对吧？那么我的理解就是说，那么以往的这样一个科技伦理，它更多的是啊科学技术共同体啊他们的这个伦理啊，那么现在呢，它是要呃拓展到整个社会、整个的社群啊，所有的利益相关者。啊，那根据我的经验，我也参与了包括人脸识别啊这样这样一些个啊公共媒体的这样一些个讨论啊，也包括一些政策的研讨啊。那我的理解就是，将来我们的这样一个医疗人工智能，像其他的人工智能一样，那、啊、它非常需要政府、产业啊这样一个呃智库啊，还有媒体以及学术界的这样一个协作啊。那为什么要这样做呢？啊，其实从理论上来讲啊。这样一个人工智能的伦理治理啊，它是一种 boundary objects 啊，它是一种边界物啊。实际上，也就是说，在不同的领域，我们可以看到法律啊、监管啊、这样一个治理啊等等啊，各个环节啊，包括产业界不同的主体，他们对这个问题，他们都会有不同的认知啊。那么，我们最后呢，这个东西是什么？它实际上是一个边界物，是一个共同啊构建的这样一个产物。那么，另外一点呢，就是。我也反思啊，我们制定了那么多的伦理原则啊，从二零一七年来，世界上制定了差不多快两百部啊伦理规范和原则。那么这些伦理规范和原则有什么用呢？我想，第一啊，他们是一种承诺啊，就是说，呃，相关的主体对于这样一个对人工智能进行伦理治理的这样一个态度啊，它有一个承诺啊，就是我要啊推推行负责任的创新啊，等等等这些。那么这个承诺，在我看来，它是什么呢？它是一种工作假设啊，它并不是一个啊金科玉律，并不是一个非常严格的这样一个法规啊。为什么呢？因为技术是在发展的啊，而这样一个人工智能它的这个创新的过程，如果有一个零到一的过程的话，那么人工智能伦理和治理它也应该有一个零到一的这样一个过程啊。
，这是呃我的这样一一点理解。那么另外一点呢，就是说，呃，一个人工智能它在这个社会上啊，它的这样一个医疗，特别是医疗人工智能，它涉及到我们每个人的生活啊。那么这里面就很重要的一点就是啊，技术的社会想象啊，来说。科技和科技的发展和社会想象，它是同时产生的啊。但是我们关于技术的想象和关于技术作为一种社会实践、社会生活的形式啊，社会机构的呃社会的这样一个呃建制，它的想象是共生的啊。这就是呃贾萨罗夫的这样一个观点啊。那么其实，在欧洲啊，欧盟的啊这样一个 Techno Life 这里面也谈到了这个里面，就是需要知道人们啊在参与这个里面的啊这样一种。呃，情感啊，为什么这么讲呢？因为在医疗人工智能时代，所有的人每时每刻都会成为受试者啊，都会成为研究的参与者。所以在这个意义上，医学里面的这样一个医研究伦理啊，或者是医患关系就扩大了啊。这里面包括很多啊，也包括比方说信任问题啊，这个人工智能去看这个医疗影像的这样一个呃影像的时候，它更准确。但是我们人要不要信任他，是吧？还有这个糖尿病人，他们进行了这样一个呃数字健康的这样一个呃共享啊知识共享。那么甚至将来这个病人他比医生知道的这个知识可能还要多啊。那么这个时候啊，医生的这样一个权威性在知识上的权威性怎么样啊？包括现在 Chat GPT 出现以后，那么如果我们去问 Chat GPT 啊哪种病该怎么治疗啊，以及我们将来把 Chat GPT 用在跟医患跟患者的这个对话里面，这都有很多问题。但是在我看来，我们将来会遇到越来越多的伦理悖论啊！比方说，我就购买过一款健康预警手表，然后呢，我就一直没有用，为什么呢？他要我输入啊，当然这个手表是好的，意思就是说，当你有紧急状况的时候啊，然后他会告诉你的亲人啊，然后甚至还告诉你的保险公司，呃，但是呢，这个里面它就会涉及到健康预警手表，它一方面它需要知道你的这些隐私的信息，但是。他怎么能够保证这些隐私得到保护啊？所以我觉得更多的是我们要去思考啊伦理的悖论啊。那么最后最后啊，就最后一个一张片子了啊。其实我是在想啊，这个我们的这样一个在新技术的这样一个发展过程中啊，监管者他往往要用各种描述新技术的隐喻来理解新技术的实质，并且以它作为一个依据啊，来对待这样一个新技术加以规制啊。那么，在这种情况下，医疗人工智能它到底是什么呢？啊，它是一个工具，是一个软件，是一个算法，是一个产品，是一个服务，还是一个啊这样一个可穿戴的、可陪伴的啊这样一个呃伴侣呢？啊，所以在这个里面，其实啊就有很多要思考的，因为你把它看成不同的东西，那么对它的这样一个合不合法、合不合规、合不合伦理的啊这样一个认知，它是不一样的啊。比方说，最近正在征求意见的。啊，生成式人工智能服务管理办法，它其实就把生成式的人工智能，把它用了这样一个信息服务这样一个领域，就把它看成是这个样子。那么看成是这个样子以后呢，那么它的规制对象就设置成对人工智能生成内容啊，它的这样一个合法性和规性的这样一个呃规制了。但是真正的问题是什么呢？生成式人工智能它不仅仅是一个服务，它很可能是这样一个我们。当代或者是未来社会的生产知识生产的这样一个发动机，知识生产的引擎啊，甚至是整个人类社会的这样一个操作系统。所以呢，我们从这里可以看到，当我们用到某一些隐喻的时候，就有可能导致啊，我们揭示了某一些问题，但是可能会放大了某一些问题，同时也会规避，呃，会会有一些出现一种啊不相呃。过度的啊，这样一个监管或者是过度的治理啊，所以呢，我就最后一句话就是，为了实现预期性的治理啊，医疗人工智能的研发和应用者本身应该更主动、更积极的参与到这个治理里面来。他们应该思考，现在在监管和治理层面所运用的新技术的隐喻是不是合适啊，并且呢，在这个思考的基础上，是不是可以提出来更恰当的隐喻。用这个来了实现预期性的治理。所谓预期性治理，就是让利益相关者、让每一个主体，他们都认为人工智能的医疗、人工智能的发展是符合他们的利益的。最后能够找到协同啊，能够找到折中的这样一个办法啊。那么我要给大家报告的啊，就这么多啊，谢谢大家。非常感谢段教授给我们分享那么精辟的一个
uh, Yan Jiang. So in the interest of time, we will have to move on to the next speaker. So would you join me again in thanking Professor Tuan Yuan for the excellent presentation. Thank you. 好的，谢谢大家。嗯，谢谢大家。So um, our next speaker is Dr. Ji Ping. So speaking about the value, she's going to share with us a an empirical research that will um, highlight some of the values and some of the concerns that we have heard Professor Duan mention. So uh, Dr. Ji Ping, as you see, has an illustrious career. So she obtained her PhD from the University of Cardiff, and um, she has been very closely involved in a number of research in initiatives from um, pharmaceutical products right through to medical AI. You find most recently uh, she has uh, moved to Sinton, which is uh, very close to us, and uh, of course uh, under the auspices of uh, Peking University, continuing to look at ethical governance or issues on that front where applies to uh, these various technological developments. So uh, with this, Ji Ping, it's over to you. Ji Ping will be presenting in Mandarin. Uh, her slides are in English. So for, for those who are not familiar with uh, the, the language, the, the slides should help. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me to be part of the conference. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, Frankly, I'm from clinical research background, so I'm a still beginner in medical AI field. Uh, but uh, honestly, I just uh, two years ago when I listened to Professor Professor Duan's talk, I was lost. But now I can follow. So I feel it's I'm making progress in this field already. Uh, for me to present, I will speak in Chinese in Mandarin. 呃，我我这个题目其实是有点长的哈。其实除了咱们这个主题来说，当时大会的主题，呃，就是 medical AI 和这个伦理以外呢，其实有还有三个关键词，一个是深圳，一个是不同视角，然后还有一个是呃定性研究的分析。这个其实呃是源于我这个其实不是一个单独的一个定性研究分析，是我想先从我们的这个背景说起哈。就是其实刚才呃段老师也说了很多，其实我们。整个全球国内都非常重视，呃，人工智能，特别也现在对医学人工智能的这个关注也特别特别多。呃，那我们在深圳呢，其实也是一样，因为深圳是中国的经济特区，也是先行示范区，呃，那也有非常好的这种创新环境，所以深圳有呃世界知名的这些呃是就是科研院所，包括这些企业，嗯、呃，包括一些嗯、呃、大型的医院。嗯，所所以在各方面的努力下吧，应该说深圳，嗯，也发布了促进人工智能的条例，嗯，也在医疗人工智能方面，其实硕果累累，也有专门的手术机器人，也有医学人工智能的这些辅助诊断系统，在国内，呃，最早应该说得到发布，但在这个过程中，嗯，其实我们。都有这种困惑，包括前面可能在 Kevin 和呃段老师的讲解中都提到，其实就是虽然现在有各种各样的共识，包括刚才的其实呃讲者的就是听众的提问中，大家都能感受到，我们有这么多大家确实觉得呃非常好的这些共识，但是我们真正在实践中还是有很多很多的困扰。就比如说这个责任分担这一块，其实我开始。参与到医疗人工智能这个课题的时候，真的就是因为我们做临床研究方面的监管的时候，特别强调研究者的职责，所以我们一开始觉得那呃我们切入点其实最第一个我做的课题也是说我们想了解说医学人工智能的这些工程师他应该承担什么责任。那在这个过程中就发现特别难，其实呃不仅仅可能是法律问题，还有就刚才前面几位讲者讲，因为这就很就是有很多现实的挑战。那在我们这个整体。就这只是一个例子哈，就是我们想落实这个问责制的时候，其实在实践中就有很多困扰。那我们在真正像现在国际国内这么多政策法规规范标准在不断的密集的出台的情况下，我们真正想做到说负责任的去做好医疗人工智能的这个可持续的这样的一些，嗯，就是研发应用的过程中，其实政府是非常非常重要的。在深圳，深圳市卫健委、科创委。其实也是，呃，为了要想制定一些合理的这样的一些，呃，就是政策来推动医疗人工智能的发展。那在这个过程中，当然就考虑到，因为这个对大家都太新了，所以我们
第一步就做了，呃，应该说开两个一系列的研究吧。因为主要第一步是觉得得先从调研，呃，这种做起，所以我们开始，呃，就是从不同的角度想了解大家，呃，在医疗人工智能相关的这些地方，它到底现在是什么样一个状态？他们做了什么？他们面临的伦理的挑战到底在哪？然后大家在现实的需求是什么？然后他们自己从一线来说，他们有哪一些，呃，需求建议？嗯，所以当时在这个设计这一块呢，其实我们是应应该是来源于三个不同的课题，从2020年到2023年，一个是呃，就刚才说到的，我们其实第一个是研究，呃，研究工程师的这个责任分担，然后又一一个是呃，深圳的呃，以人工智能的社会治理实验中，嗯、呃，一一个课题，然后还还有一个是我们的呃，深圳科技伦理。治理的这个实施方案设计这一块，就这三个课题过程中，因为我们，呃，就是有都有不同的主题，但是你们有一个共性的，就是我们都有医疗人工智能这一部分。所以当时我我这次分享的时候，其实是把这陆陆续续这三个课题里，我们有应该有八次访谈，包括了我们的科研院所，包括了我们的大型的这些医院，还有政府的这主要是两委，就是我们的科创委和卫健委的监管政府监管部门，以及我们这些龙头企业。嗯，包括我们深圳的区域伦理委员会的委员，我们在这些过就是中间呃交流做过程中的一些，呃一些初步的一些数据分析。一个从政府监管这块其实，嗯，我我自己的一个直接的感受哈，因为以前在学校的时候，其实没有跟官员有太多的呃接触，但真真实实在深圳接触到以后，我觉得其实政府官员。其实他们是有很强的一些职责在身上，就是刚才提，刚才段老师也提到，我们现在对呃国家的法规要求来说，对各个呃监责任主体的要求都很高，所以我们呃就是政府的部门的官员也不也在全就是尽其所能吧，再去了解，也也也想把这些整体工作做好。那其实大家一个共识就是现在的这个呃。是医学人工智能，应该说是涉及多方面的监管部门。就跟刚才呃段老师提到，我们现在中国重磅的两个法规，其实在并行的过程中，大家这个感受就更深。就从国家层面到我们呃市级层面都有这个问题。就现在呃，大家对医疗人工智能的研发的关注度很高，呃，所以这样的话，就在各个又存在。多方管理的时候，大家又存在这个职责分分界不清楚，就真的会说，那到底应该谁来管这个权责边界在哪？在这个讨论过程中，深刻的体会到，就是其实一定是要呃建一个协调机制，这是这是应应该说是我们经过多多次讨论还有学习，呃，应该说也是达成一致的，觉得一定要在政府层面哈，就是各个呃。就是监管部门机构机构之间要有一个行之有效的这样的一个协调机制。嗯，另外一个在我们政府的这些官员访谈中，其实大家都体会到，就是现在要加强监管，加强伦理的这个整体的这个审查。但是确确实实的来说，我们可能现在目前比较成熟的，在我们中国来说，应该是医学研究这一块。但是真正在医疗人工智能这块，无论说把它划分到医疗器械。嗯，还是呃不划分到医疗器械这个里面，其实都存在说具体的这些可以操作的这些工具，其实还是不足的。所以呃，一个讨论也是觉得要迫切的，其实应该从呃政府来主导，或者说我们的这些呃科技科学共同体啊，或者行业组织，能够出台一些真正关于医学人工智能研究的这种可操作性的这种工作指引，其实是。呃，大家觉得很迫切。另外一个，我们现在都在讨论分险。刚才开文奇也提到很多，其实我们最困扰的就是这个，呃，分险的这个分级分类。因为要加强呃这个分险的监管的话，那首先你得做好评估，而且在过程中的去监测，那到底怎么样去给它分级，然后怎么样在全生命周期中做好这个分险的这个评估，这块其实。现在应该说，我们也是呃，觉得这这肯定也是需要一些实质性的工具。我们自己看到，在英国国家统计局，他们发布有一个应该是数据中心，呃、不是针针对医疗人工智能，但是在针对数据的这一块，他们有一个嗯、呃，就伦理的一个自我评估的一个表。然后它是根据这些原则，每一条原则呃都会有一些具体的指标，然后再去打分。通过打分以后，再分呃就是低中高三个分险，再有不同的一些。嗯，监管策略，我觉得这个是我们期待的，就是我们也希望我们的医疗人工智能
，也能够有这样的可用的一些实质性的工具。嗯，另外就是，其实政府就各方面吧，就包括刚才他们提到，我非常认同的那个呃伦理公制的这个表述。其实现在应应该说，肯定不可能像呃，就是传统的研究说自自上而下，政府呃或者我们权威机构定一些标准，定一些监管治理的体系，大家就能去行之有效的运行起来。实实在在的来说，现在医疗人工智能的这个特别感受到，就真的是需要建立。呃，多方共治这种就是各方面参与的，而且得合作沟通的这样的一些机制。呃，那再就是我们从跟行业沟通这一块，跟这些企业来沟通。其实我们会发现，以前我们特别担忧企业，会认为企业可能，呃，因为逐利呀、啊，各方面可能对伦理是。呃，会被被他们严重的忽略。其实我们真正在交流的过程中会发现，企业它不仅仅非常非常重视，嗯、呃，这些数据的隐私、安全保护以外，其实现在至少我们在访谈的这四家大型企业来说，都非常关注伦理方面，因为甚至他们有专门的伦理研究院，也有成立了科技伦理委员会。嗯、呃，但是当然这里面大家还是也在讨论，其实来说。嗯，虽然是关注哈，但是真正的还是有很多挑战。比如说，大家的伦理意识确实还是不足的。也这方面，整体你你现在虽然说企业是一个创新的责任主体，但它真正在伦理的这个能力方面也是还是比较薄弱的。那所以他们最关心的是，千万就是不能违法。所以怎么样能够守住底线？怎么样能够合规的创新？其实，在我们。呃，跟企业座谈的时候也有很多交流哈。其实企业也是觉得迫切希望能够加强伦理的这个教育。既然对他有要求，那他也希望了解到底呃伦理是什么，然后也希望在企业里形成这些一些文化氛围。然后碰到一些困难的时候，或者他们有一些拿不准的事情，他们其实特别希望能够得到政府或者学术组织在这方面的一些咨询，这方面的一些支持指导。呃，另外我们也看到就是。其实我们这些企业也已经在采取一些措施，嗯，在在加强伦理这一方面哈，因为有些机构他们已经有单位有伦理手册，然后在新员工入职的时候也有伦理的培训，然后他们也会积极参加，嗯，一些伦理方面的这些学术交流，嗯，然后去参加一些呃这种讨论。那在这个过程中，嗯，就是因为现在国家要求就是责任主体都要建立。呃，这种就是伦理的组织架构，然后还要做伦理审查。其实，嗯，我们当时讨论挺多的，就是这些企业它有很大的困扰，就是他们可以按照国家要求去建，但是建了以后，这个伦理委员会它的运行的质量到底怎么样？其实他们也是，呃，就是也是存疑的。所以他们希望的是，希有能有，呃，专门就是国家也好，就是各行反正权力部门吧，能够提供。伦理的这个审查的这种认证标准，然后还有或者正好最好能够提供这样的服务，然后保证他们既然做这件事儿，其实他们也希望合规的能做好。嗯，再就是因为确实人工智能的这些，它的这个技术的差别非常大，而且应用场景也差别特别大。其实他们也希望说，呃，能够在。有适合他们的这样的一些审查的流程，因为比如说手术机器人和一个辅助的这些诊断系统的开发，其实它里面的要求肯定是不一样的。他们也希望能够保证审查的这些嗯质量和效率。嗯，再一个其实也是前面其实也有讲者提到，就是嗯我们在座谈中，我们这些企业也确实提到他们。嗯，因为现在有一些在国际贸易中，他们这种国际化的公司会受到一些有面临一些壁垒吧，也确实有些是因为说，呃，法律或者伦理方面的问题，所以他们其实，在合规性方面其实是很非常非常重视，但是他们也希望说，因为现在国我们国内自己出台这么多法规，一方面肯定是为了促进，呃，咱们的整体的这些医疗人工智能的产品的研发能够。呃，确实要符合这些国际共识哈，但是，呃，也提到说不要过于限制。这个其实刚才有一个呃，就是听众的提问，这个其实是当时我们在呃，应该说我们好几家企业在讨论中都特别特别关注的。他是希望说，呃，首先说从企业自己会有合规部门去熟悉这些国际要求，但也希望国家在制定我们国内的政策的时候，嗯、呃，就是也要
考虑，就是国际的这些规范以后呢，能够。更去支持我们本地的这些企业创新，否则的话，如果太管的太过于严的话，可能企业就会呃没法做一些工作了。然后也希望能够更多的，就是各个方面吧，他们企业自身也会努力，也希望我们政府或者学术团体能够参与到国际的这些行业规范和标准的制定中去。嗯，再就是我们在和这些科研院所交流的时候，嗯，其实最大的一个体会就是。呃，这个多学科的这这种学车交学差交科，就是学科交叉这一块因为我们传统的临床研究可能就医生和嗯、呃、流行病学或者统计师的这种团队比较多。那现在其实我们越来越多的会发现，我们会碰到有纯纯学数学的，学呃就是技术类，甚至就是自动化，就这些方面的这这种交流，计算机科学就就会发现，确实在这种多学科交叉的过程中。呃，我们的这些研究团队的，就科研院所的这些访谈者就提到，他们其实很多时候也很困惑，就是这种多学科合作的这种衔接问题。就衔接里面，其实呃特别重要的就是相互能够听听得懂，就否则的话，就可能他们懂算法的人因为不懂医，懂医的不懂算法，最后出来的一些辛辛苦苦做的一些产品，可能最后应用的价值就特别有限。嗯，所以再一个就是在利益分配上，因为大家都从自己的角度去投入了，那到底最后这个呃权益怎么分配？最最重要的，其实当时我们讨论最多的也是这个责任划分这一块。其实大家都觉得，嗯，确实如一如果说按传统的临床研究的模式，我们说，嗯，工程师因为你设计了这个产品，那如果这产品出现一些问题的时候，就应该负主要的责任。但其实我们工程师也告诉我们，因为很多这些呃人工智能呢，它其实产品是一个。团队的工作，而且它是有全流程中间其实有很多环节的。他们可能在早期的时候，他们是写了这个算法，但他们并不知道将来这个会最后会怎么被应用场景会怎么样，所以他们也很难去把控。所以觉得，如果让他们工程师来，虽然他们是一个产品的研发者，但让他们来承担这些主要的责任，其实是也不太合理，也不太现实。所以当时讨论也是觉得，确实这个责任的这个。认定吧，这个确实是需要基于不同的产品，也需要更多的、更深的一些研究来来做。再一个，跟科研院所交流的时候，其实，嗯，也体会到，这些科研院所其实他他们这些就是来自、呃，特别是工科背景的这些工程师们，其实，嗯，也都自己也也也提出来说，觉得现在伦理大家都很关注，但是到底什么是伦理，他们也希望说。呃，大家都说要符合伦理的来设计，那怎么样能把这些伦理的这些价值观的要求，这些看上去比较宏观抽象的这些，呃，变到就是能让他们真正理解，而且他们能够用用到的这些工具，其实这是他们特别大的一个期待和诉求。就真的是，呃，所以当时我们也是在讨论过程中，一个肯定要提高我们这些工程师的伦理的这种素养和敏感度吧。所以他们肯定得先也也是得提供充分的伦理培训。呃，那另外也希望说，呃，就是虽然说我们划分职责不能全部归给我们的工程师，但是工程师他也得有一些行业的一些就是底线和一些守则规范，他得就是知道有一哪一些确实不能做。嗯、呃，另外其实除了我们对这些研究主体设计主体的要求以外，也体会到可能整体要想符合伦理的来设计的话。还是需要我们在设计过程中，让我们的伦理专家，或者让就大家能够有这种合作的这种一些机制和流程，包括这个产品在设计和最后要出来的时候，要有一些整体的这些伦理方面的这些评估评价，这些可能就会更好的能够实现我们期望的说，嗯，能够让我们的不不仅仅说满足这些呃就是技术性能方面的要求，又能够满足我们伦理上面的这些要求。嗯，最后其实，嗯，应该说也是我我们自己接触最最多的哈，就是我们本身其实我平时工作中也主要做伦理审查这一块，当时很大的一个呃看到的一些问题就是现在医疗人工智能的项目真的是，应该说数量是一直在增加，但是我们在这个过程中，呃，就是很大的困扰，就是因为医疗人工智能它的特点。决定了，就是挑战也非常大。确实，我们应应应该就是这种惯性思考。我们因为本身做临床研究，所以一开始拿到这些课题，我们就想，哎，那现在医医学研究的这些这些呃很多规范标准，是不是能够适用于医疗人工智能呢？
，确实也发现有有很多有一些不一不适用的地方哈。但是不适用的话，那我们到底那我们怎么样来够能够高效率的，然后能够高质量的做好这个伦理审查工作？其实也是我们，这是我们现在也应该说从去年也是启动也在做的一项工作。我们希望给医疗人工智能的这些研发。嗯，就是特别是在机构要进行伦理审查的这些项目，提供一些实实在在的一个指导工作指引。我们准备就是根据不同的场景，嗯，去去做一些就是它的在伦理审查中的一些考量点。嗯，比如说我们其实现在看到的一个很大的问题就是方案设计这块。其实我们虽然希望，嗯，我们这些产品技术都是可靠的，它的方案都是科学性都是有保障的，嗯，风险也是可控的，但是其实我们在就是拿到的这些课题中，呃，申申报的课题中会看到，因为我们很多方案就是工程师可能侧重的是他的这些呃技术方面的描述，但其实真正去做一个临床研究的这种评价方面是非常不足的。其实国国际上也有相应的文献报道，应该不足百分之五十的这些发表的这些文章是符合那个英国 NICE 它里面有一个最低限的那个标准的。所以其实这个也是一个很严峻的问题，就是我们其实。大家都想做，但是可能技术是没问题了，但它的这个评估这个技术的这个方案，它的科学性其实还是有很大问题。嗯，另外就是我们，咱们第二天、明天也主要是以数据的治理这个相关。确实，我们在数据和这个算法这这两方面，其实是跟人工智能密不可分的，没法割裂开。所以我们在。审查这些项目的时候，必须去关注我们的数据的这些处理的相关的活动。你数据是从哪来的？数据要用于什么？然后为什么用？这个的合理、正当、必要的这些原则是一定要落实好，包括它的保密、安全性、透明、共享。呃，这这块其实是包括我们算法的这些偏见，这些其实都是需要我们在伦理审查中要特别去关注的。再一个特别大的挑战就是知情同意的获取这一块，因为我们传统的研究可能就是具体的一个项目就是一个一个一个书面的知情同意，但其实，在人工智能这一块，我们在做这个指引的时候就会发现，其实挑战就非常大，因为嗯，它各种各样的情况，而且在这个研究的在不同阶段，可能需要这方面都就得需要有一些嗯充分的考量，就是我们必至少得合法，然后还得可行。所以这个也是，嗯，我们觉得也是在期期待在后续的几天的讨论中，嗯，能够能够有有那个有有有讨论。再就是我们因为伦理审查里，嗯，除了我们建这些规则标准以外，其实很重要的是我们委员的能力的提升。他委员能够，就是具备审查医疗人工智能的这个能力，其实也是特别重要。一方面，我们是给我们现有的委员培训；一方面。我们也希望能够吸纳真正医疗人工智能领域的专家加入到我们的这个就是审查委员会。嗯，那最后就是想跟大家呃分享的，就是我们其实嗯最一开始我们的大会主席也提到，其实我们现在因为医疗人工智能这个领域确实比较新，所以现在虽然有很多很多的嗯也确实是大家认可的共识在这儿，但是其实我们在实践中很多困扰还是需要大家共同去。思考和探讨，而且可能很多也还是没有标准答案。但即使没有标准答案，也需要我们一起去努力。呃，至少就是我们现在眼前最迫切的，就是我们也经常说的哈，就是要守住底线。我们在医疗人工智能的研发过程中，一定要合规。嗯，另外就是风险的这一块，其实也是我们现在最迫切想得到这方面的一些嗯，就是指引和分享的，特别是实就是实操实际操作层面。另外，嗯，就是怎么样提高我们在医疗人工智能领域的这个审这个伦理审查的能力，还有我们真的怎么建一个，就是这种能够呃、嗯、参与性的这种伦理共治的这种架构。特别我觉得现在可能跟国际来比的话，我自己感受就是我们可能在公众参与这块，包括嗯透明性这块，可能是我们要真的是要更要着力去加强的。因为在国际上，我看很多他做。嗯，这些数据也好，人工智能的这些方面也好，其实就是有很多都是有这种公众的调研，有有这些特别就是 solid 的这种就是一些数据支持吧。但我觉得我们可能在呃，我我自己觉得这个是我们现在要是想实现，可能这块是我们希望能够更多去投入的。嗯，还有就是刚才提到，其实说怎么样让我们这些
嗯技术，真的把伦理考就是嵌入到它的这个整个设计研发过程中，这个我觉得也是一个挺大的一个呃一个一个一个内容吧，就是我们也。就不能空谈，就是我自己也是觉得，因为我本身不是学伦理，也不是学人工智能的，在这些工作过程中，我也有过这个困惑，就是到底这个伦理原则，就是那些原则哈，也很简练，但我们也觉得它是对的，但到底怎么在日常工作中给它真的把它用好、把握好，其实也是有过这种困扰。我我我相信，所以我们在跟工程师交流后，我也更多的觉得，确实是需要这些工具、一些流程、一些机制。让我们把这些伦理的这种价值观，给它就是嵌入到这个这个这个里面。再就是，呃，也是我们最近也是因为也是有一个任务哈，就是还是要嗯、呃、去把虽虽然我们知道就是这个责任划分非常难，但是我们还是需要去尽可能的去从研发的这个阶段来去看到底嗯、呃、谁应该担什么责，就从各个责任主体。然后这些，嗯，而且还是得合理的来划分。反正就这些也是我期待在我们后面这一天、这两天、三天的这个咱们的这个论论坛中，能够听到各其他各位嗯讲者的更专业的讲者的这个精彩的分享。呃，那最后也是感谢我们所有这些项目中的这些参与者，还有我们深圳市立建委和科创委的支持。那特别感谢我们嗯、呃、团团队的成员有。嗯，北京大学的丛雅丽教授，还有张海红博士，还有我们嗯深圳的生物医学伦理审查委员会的肖平主任委员，还有我们去深圳市生物伦理委员会的朱丹娜秘书。嗯，那我要报告的内容就这些，谢谢。非常感谢吉平博士与我们分享过丰富的报告。We will be hearing next from our Speakers from Canada. So, having heard about the situation on mainland China,、uh, we will, following this, hear from Professor Colleen Flood, who will be introduced by my co-director, and then Dr. Man Sawati.、Uh, so, with this, Professor Long, over to you. Thank you so much.、Uh, it's a, my pleasure to introduce、uh, Professor Colleen Flood, who is from the University of Ottawa.、Uh, she is the research chair in health law and policy, and、um, also the inaugural director of the Ottawa Centre for Health Law Policy and Ethics.、Uh, Probably, she has been、um, supported by a CIHR grant to、um, study the governance of health-related AI, and she is an author of many, many books and, of course,、um, other publications.、Um, Yeah, while she's preparing,、um, she her topic is going to be on machine MD.、Uh, very terrifying concept、uh, to me as a clinician.、Um, it's going to be about Canada's legal governance of safety and privacy in health AI. All right, here we are. We're sorry, we're just figuring out a little tech,、uh, few tech things here. Um, my great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much to Kelvin and、uh, to you for the wonderful invitation,、uh, and、uh, just thrilled to be in、uh, such a great、um, company and such an interesting、uh, set of talks and discussions that are planned、uh, for the next couple of、uh, days. So,、uh, an amazing program. Thank you very much.、Um, So、uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about、uh, work that I've been doing with、um, our research team. We call it Machine MD, and、uh, my colleagues are listed here. Some of them, anyway.、Uh, it's a mix of innovators,、uh, AI innovators, and legal scholars. I'm more of a health law scholar. My my colleague Teresa Scars is probably the leading privacy law scholar in in、uh, Canada. Uh, and we are endeavouring, as 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 we said in the last couple of uh, uh, talks, to really work in a multidisciplinary、uh, way to address、um, issues around the governance of legal AI. And、uh, our our original starting point we started a few years ago was to ask the question whether our existing laws that we have、uh, will be sufficient to meet the challenges. Of health AI and machine learning,、um, so are they fit for purpose? What we already have, we already have a lot of governance, particularly in healthcare. So the question is, do we? What do we need to change, if anything?、Uh, 
uh, to respond to the challenges that are coming. So we, we try to come in with a sense of equanimity. Um, but what we thought from the beginning was that a lot of the early work uh, from, uh, from the humanities was very much in the vein of, you know, uh, the sky is about to fall in, Terminators are here, you know, this is terrible, um, basically doom and gloom. And so we wanted to try to move past that a little bit. And we felt the best way to do that was to actually use case studies. So to look at actual AI applications in healthcare, um, to try to understand those innovations as deeply as we can from, you know, I have no, I have no expertise in that whatsoever, but from, so I as a lawyer can actually say better and more intelligent things about what law reform should be. So we had, we tried to pick a spread of things from different aspects of the healthcare system and um, to reveal problems and uh, technologies that seemed more or less risky as well. Uh, so we could then um, explore deeply uh, the legal issues and whether our laws, Canadian laws, are fit for purpose. So basically we got into a room for usually a day, a half day, when the pandemic happened, we switched to Zoom, actually worked perfectly, so yay Zoom, it's not so bad. And um, and we would have pre-meetings with the innovator, understand the technology more with some selected legal scholars. So someone on the liability side, the privacy side, the informed consent side usually. Uh, and then they would make short, sharp presentations in the, um, in the meeting and we'd get together and write a report um, send it around to everyone, get more feedback, and finally release it. The reports have been, um, this whole, some of this process has been funded by CIFA, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, and I'll show you the link to the, to the reports soon. So we've got about six of them. Um, I think an important part of this for me was that we uh, had patients as part of the process. I mean, I, it's probably obvious to you that we would have innovators and probably clinicians which we did. Uh, but we also had policymakers and patients. And I think that this just added enormously to our understanding and insights. The patients asked all the hard questions that everyone was sort of poofing around on uh, and uh, helped, us, helped us understand. So I'm just going to briefly skim over these case studies um, so I can get to some of the insights. So... Um, Devin Singh is a core member of the team. He works with us continually. He is an emergency uh, pediatric physician and an innovator. So we got one guy, we got kind of a bunch of things. I don't know how you get that smart, but it's nice. Uh, and he designed this tool, which basically kid comes in to the ER, fallen off the playground, may have a broken bone, usually waits for a long time to see the physician. This tool basically inputs the, his, the kid's data using big data will then say x-ray, no x-ray. Uh, so without having to see the physician, uh, speeds up the entire process enormously. Uh, it's a pretty cool technology. Uh, and so we workshop that one, for example. Um, this one sounds a little similar to some of what was being presented earlier. This is an OR black box tool, the, the uh, primary innovator is actually a brain surgeon, Theodor, Theodor Grachanov, but his colleague Frank here was uh, working with us on this. They film everything that happens in a surgical setting. The most dangerous spot in the world is in a surgical setting. Um, they film it all and then they use big data to help um, figure out near misses, actual mistakes, and so on. Uh, and we were workshopping, uh, they use it as a quality control tool. So to sort of look back at um, the most recent sort of surgical encounter and, and explore, you know, what could we have done better? So it's protected there by sort of quality assurance legislation and protection. So we were looking at moving it out of that space and into real time so where it, they would actually use it in real time to advise oh you know nurse a has 
grab the blue line, we would be thinking it's the pink line. Um, so, you know, obviously a big, a big leap forward for them to do that. So we're exploring the legal issues around some of that. I'll just mention one more. Uh, this one is a suicide uh, artificial intelligence prediction heuristic. This is a colleague who was with me in Ottawa, Zachary Kaminsky, psychiatrist. So he's mining publicly available Twitter data, and then the kind of conversational analysis can show if people are veering more towards suicidal ideation. Uh, actually, some of this has also been able to predict post um, uh, postnatal depression combined with genetic information as well. So. Um, you know, obviously very significant concerns from privacy and, and everything as per the last presenter is going to be in how this is actually employed, like in what place will it be employed? There's a lot of options here and some are more or less terrifying, uh, but, you know, used in the employment setting could be quite worrisome in all sorts of ways, but maybe used by a family doctor if you consent to monitor uh, your depression or moving in and out of depression, perhaps okay. So, uh, so that was a really interesting thing. I'm going to jump across some of these. One we were working on is a digital twin. Uh, another one is a cardiac arrest prediction uh, in the ICU. Again, this is in a pediatric ICU. Uh, this one is an intelligent powered wheelchair, uh, basically a self-driving wheelchair from working with uh, colleagues in uh, in Quebec at the University of um, Sherbrooke. So you can sort of see some of the things that we have been looking at. And here are the reports now, they're uh, in French and English, <laughs> but uh, we're just discussing teaching in many languages and uh, different languages and uh, across different uh, legal traditions. So, and in com combination with that, um, we've also been uh, working on um, a scoping review of all the uh, material that has been published around legal issues and AI. Uh, it was, it's been a big job. We've got about 11,000 articles we've been plowing through because, you know, like we like suffering. But the idea of it is that we want to see what different um, disciplines are saying are the relevant legal issues. So what are lawyers putting forward as the, their largest concerns and what are clinicians and different kinds of clinicians, we've actually got them all by different specialties and types. What are they saying are the key legal issues from their perspective? And computer scientists, what are they saying, engineers? So um, we've, we've, we're getting there. We've almost finished writing it. So hopefully we'll be getting this out uh, shortly. But as you can see, it's been a long, a bit of a long process. So all of that combined sort of has helped us start to think about these things. And we're starting to, um, oh, pardon, uh, get some of the, the richness uh, to come out. And I don't have too long. All right, so uh, I can't uh, dive into all of this. So I'll just make a few comments about some of the things that we've seen coming through around informed consent, um, privacy and safety and liability and, and try and um, uh, move the conversation along. Um, so one of the things I think that has been interesting that came out through our, our talk, our case studies and we're seeing in the scoping review is basically a, a conflation of two types of consent. So in healthcare, when we talk about informed consent, we're usually meaning about to the treatment itself. But our, our legal scholars and ethical scholars, and actually everyone in the room was talking about informed consent also to the use of the data in the same kind of way that we talk about informed consent to the healthcare. And it seemed to me that they're actually conflating the legal issues or kind of wanting informed consent to data to have the same sort of weight and purpose as it does for healthcare. And uh, so we were starting to interrogate uh, that uh, a bit. And um, like starting with, for example, the consent to the sharing of personal health information. 
uh, you know, with AI in the room in a healthcare setting, it's not just you and the physician anymore, right? It's you and the physician, and then the AI machine learning tool, which may be actually owned by somebody else, controlled by somebody else or a different entity, uh, and maybe sharing data with many other people. Um, so uh, the way that we've normally dealt with, at least in Canadian law and in many other jurisdictions, I think this, this problem of um, consent to sharing of personal health information when we need data for research and other purposes is if you anonymize it, it's fine, right? So we have great massive gobs of anonymized health data in Canada and you don't have to seek permission of the patient to use that data. Um, but as we all know, um, that kind of protection is not really much, potentially much protection anymore. Um, but that all our privacy laws are built upon that, really. If it's anonymized, knock yourself out. Um, but if it's personal health information, yes, you have to go through all the bells and whistles. You've got to get this. But now we know that um, there is AI itself, of course, is helping to potentially um, switch that around. So now the information can be re-identify uh, particular patients. Um, so those are, you know, I think uh, a lot of concern for folks, um, what will this will mean and whether our laws are sufficiently um, fit for purpose. And then when we come to the question of, um, of consent, what, we're, what, what, what worry comes through, I think, is that within the healthcare setting, you know, we, we spend a lot of time trying to persuade patients that they need to trust their physician and their healthcare professional. Trust me. You know, I've spent many years of training and I know what I'm doing. And so you should give me your information so I can help you better. Uh, and so there's such an emphasis on that. And then, you know, now we've got basically a third party in the room that the physician may be heavily dependent upon, really, for decision making. So when you're asking me to consent to the treatment, and then simultaneously that the treatment includes the AI tool that will be collecting my information. Am I giving that tool too much trust, right? Am I trusting that because I'm trusting the patient? So that's something that we thought is, um, is a concern. Uh, I don't think we've uh, figured out the solution, but it's certainly something that needs to be dealt with. Um, another issue around is then consent to the treatment itself. Um, so using AI, should a, a physician, should a patient, you know, sorry, should a physician seek the actual consent of the patient to the treatment? Or do you say, well, it's just like any other tool I've got going in the room. You know, I've got all sorts of geek all going on here. I've got computer and this, that, and the other. I don't seek their consent to any of these things. So this is, uh, I think, a big and live issue, whether, that sh whether they should consent. I think I'm of the view that uh, at least initially they should, uh, for at least for some specific reasons. Um, and I'll get to those in a minute. Um, and when we're seeking informed consent, if we think that informed consent is needed, of course, the problem is that the physician may not have fantastic information to present to the patient about what the risks and benefits are of using the AI treatment, right? Now, this is not to say, and I want to stress, that the, the, a physician never needs to tell the patient exactly how the AI tool is working. That would be ridiculous. But they do have to be able to advise the patient about what any particular risk for that patient are in using that tool. And I think that's the tricky part, right? Do they have that information, sufficient information to say, look, Colleen, uh, your age, your gender, blah, 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 you know, this is the risk. 
So, uh, and I think this then leads to this obvious concern around algorithmic bias, which we all understand to be um, a very big issue. Uh, and, you know, that the, um, and that this links to safety and liability, right? So that the safety of the patient may be at risk if the, if the machine has not been trained on data that represents the patient. Now, it might not be, it may be just fine, right? The physiology or everything may make no difference at all. I think we have to keep that in mind just because it hasn't been trained on totally representative data doesn't mean that there is actually a problem, but there could be a problem, right? There could be, and we may not know till we actually start using the AI tool on that uh, subpopulation. So if it's a tool that has not been trained on the elderly at all, like uh, the very elderly, say we won't know if it works on them until we try it on them, much as we find out with um, with drugs, right? So that's uh, an issue. Uh, so I think one of the things that we are questioning is um, first, uh, you know, as the regular, should the regulator, the medical device regulator, require the um, warning labels on AI medical devices about risks to certain populations? So this data has not been trained on this and that population, you know, should we advise, at least advise that? And then is that really meaningful? You know, you open up those sort of packets of all the you know, the, you, you can't do this and you can't do that and becomes so meaningless that you don't even take it for real. You know, no one reads those things. So is that going to be uh, sufficient? And then at least perhaps um, if there are some warning labels that then the physician may have a duty uh, to, as part of informed consent, to at least advise the patient that uh, upon whom the AI is being used that there is some risk here because it hasn't been developed on people of a certain racialized group or gender or whatever. So I think uh, these are issues that are coming through for us. Um, another issue, of course, and I was just talking to somebody who is working with uh, AI, uh, part of an AI company, um, is the use of contracts. And many of you have probably thought about this and written on this as well, but I think this is the use of private law here by lawyers working for innovators to basically say, look, none of the, none of the uh, buck stops here, right? It's I'm gonna pass it down to the physician and to the hospital. And I think this is deeply worrisome because the physician and the hospital are also saying, you know, physicians don't want to be left out of this coming revo revolution. If I go back, they, they want to be the provider in the loop, right? This is actually how they're all calming down when we talk to them about AI, this sort of general freak out. And it's like, no, no, you'll still be there, provider in the loop, you'll still have this role. But if your role is not really a real role, right, that there's uh, bio, automation bias and so on. You don't really understand what's happening. At the same time, they're writing contracts to transfer all the liability for the decision-making onto your back. I think that's deeply worrisome. And especially since from a patient perspective, it's really hard to sue them, right? Really difficult for patients to actually succeed uh, in suing really anybody, but particularly physicians. Yeah, it's like 99 to 1 kind of chance in Canada and US that you'll succeed. So, um, so I think this makes me worried about the use of private law. So in a nutshell, contract law and tort law doesn't seem to us to be doing the work sufficiently to meet the concerns of AI and that we do need more protective regulation uh, before the harms happen. So in Canada, then, the focus for us is on Health Canada and the Medical Device and Directorate. Medical, medical Device Directorate is the one that regulates uh, hard medical devices in the past, uh, and that has now expanded to include software, even when it's not part of a hard device. 
Um, there are a lot of holes in what uh, their kind of current regulatory approach, which I won't go into too much now, but maybe we'll get some time in question. And so part of the work that we're proposing going forward is to evaluate um, Health Canada's uh, regulatory approach uh, to AI software to other jurisdictions. So we have um, got a kind of questionnaire that we've built coming out of our analysis and we want to walk, work around the world to say, okay, how is how all these different jurisdictions are uh, regulating medical devices with AI and have they all got the same problems or gaps or whatever uh, or not. Um, there's a new bill, um, a piece of legislation that has been proposed in Canada. It's not passed yet, which proposes to uh, regulate AI more broadly. Uh, and the idea with this is it will be regulating uh, high impact uh, AI. However, it's one of these pieces of legislation that was rushed through um, because we may be going into an election and they wanted to say they'd done something on it. Um, and so we don't have a lot of detail about what this actually means. It's all to come about by regulation. But one of the interesting things is that there will be a duty on um, AI innovators and um, manufacturers to uh, vet for algorithmic bias, that they will ha actually have an obligation to attend to that um, as part of the manufacturing process. So, um, so that that is interesting. But you know, one thing from the medical device perspective is it's not clear that this new bill if and when it's passed, will actually apply to the medical device side. So we're going to perhaps have some uh, competing kind of regulatory developments happening at the same time. Uh, so, you know, watch this space for Canadian confusion part two. But hopefully we'll sort it out kind of quickly. And then uh, anyway, so that is uh, my talk. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, be delighted to take any questions that you might have? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Flood. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I think in the interest of time, we might have to move on. I uh, just want to thank Professor Flood again sorry, for this. Sorry. I, I just I'm looking at here like, oh, ask me another question. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, we'll, we'll do it during lunchtime. But I do hope that you will develop some kind of machine lawyers who will defend human doctors in the future as well. Being a clinician, I would love to have that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, uh, Professor Flood, for the wonderful presentation. We are now going to hear from Dr. Mani Zawati. Uh, so Dr. Zawati is with uh, the Center for uh, Genomics and Policy, a close collaborator of ours uh, at McGill University. And uh, as you'd see, Dr. Zawati has done amazing work in a range of very innovative technologies. Uh, for, uh, but he's going to speak to us on something that's uh, a rather more accessible in terms of thinking about uh, devices, and that's, of course, uh, health apps on smartphones. So we all have smartphones, and, and therefore um, you'd have a much broader range of users. Uh, you see, of course, Dr. Zawati, a very accomplished scholar with, uh, well, hundred more than a hundred chapters and journal papers. So um, extremely prolific. Uh, so thank thank you so much for spending time with us, um, Man, and um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Calvin, for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be in Hong Kong. Um, I've always been an admirer of the movies of Wong Kar Wai and, and Christopher Doyle's cinematography. So for many years, I've been looking at Hong Kong through the lens and it's time for me to see it through my own eyes. So wonderful to be here. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk to you about smartphone uh, crowdsourced medical um, apps, applications, um, present to you some of the recent ethical and legal work that been, uh, we've been doing, and uh, I'll be showing you some preliminary research uh, data. Um, so I'm going to very quickly start with, um, with a uh, prelude 
uh, an introduction, but um, the goal of today's talk is going to talk about the crowdsourcing uh, uh, medical data and then talk to you about an atlas that we've been trying to work on um, in the past few months. Um, one of the really big difficulties, and I don't know if you've ever tried this, is to do a search uh, using the platforms like uh, Google Play or, or the App Store. Uh, it's very difficult for you to have um you know sort of a list of results and and because the goal is to make it almost infinite uh so just to give you a bit of a sense so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and uh, finish the talk with with some of the ethical and legal concerns um there's more than five billion uh people around the world that own medical devices i think this is a very conservative number just looking at my colleagues and, and my family members um but but this is this is the data that we have more than 50 percent of cell phones have been uh, used to collect and process health data and what really interested us is this aspect of of that it is currently frequently being repurposed uh for ai training and biomedical research so not just you know from the application perspective but really for me research perspective and and all of the issues that this you know brings to the fore um you know the repurposing of, of health data is is in fact going to be useful uh, for either research or algorithm training but as you'll see from my presentation the applications themselves especially their privacy policies um are often big uh, ambiguous and and do not really provide us with a lot of very clear information about how they plan to use and share the collected data. And you know, uh, just to, for terminology's sake, when I talk about smartphone crowdsourcing medical data, I talk about tools and applications, either that that you know um, the data itself is collected uh, uh, feeds into a single data set of multiple uh, users that's one possibility uh, the data is collected by multiple apps and then feed into one data set that's another one and and uh, another possibility is that you have multiple data sets uh, that that are independently compiled uh, for research purposes and thinking about its value I mean we've just heard um, some of the issues that arise in these applications, especially around bias. There is a merit in, in the fact of it being accessible. So there is some merits when it comes to diversity of the, of the mobile health data with obvious caveats that come with it. Uh, but we also understand if we're looking at emerging medical innovations, uh, they're quite data dependent. And, and uh, you know, that, that really does affect the quality of these innovations. So just preliminarily, uh, some of the issues that that led us to think about this more more specifically, and, and they've been touched on by previous speakers as well, um, you know, is the issue of applicability first and foremost in terms of what applies uh, using the current research regimes. Um, the question of anonymization. I mean, my interest is in genomics. Um, you know, can we talk about uh, uh, de-identified uh, information uh, at all times? This is a this is an issue. Uh, questions of data breach, of course. Um, every instance of data sharing uh, increases that risk, uh, and and AI bias. Um, you know, they they could potentially be further entrenched in in this uh, particular case. Um, we've also heard very quickly, but some of the legal frameworks in Canada. Um, as as you've heard, this is being you know worked on, and and but but also the the gaps and the issues uh, raised are are important for us to keep an eye on. And Quebec, uh, the province in Canada where where I work, uh, there has been some recent legislation around this, uh, but again, not specific to AI, but more related to uh, data protection of personal inf information more specifically and there are some elements in there when it comes to consent and and the type of data that is being used so some of the legal app, uh, gaps uh, and and you know some of the things that we've been zeroing in in the past few months um there's a difference you know at least in terms of of um the the you know the dichotomy here between algorithm training and research but you know, I also work as an access officer for 
um, you know, a, a national database in, in Canada, the HostSeq database, which was created during the COVID pandemic uh, to allow researchers to access uh, genomic data. Um, and when we're receiving right now the applications for controlled access uh, 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 data, um, it's very clear that it is for algorithm training. And when we start asking questions to the researchers about, you know, is this really research? Um, they even don't, you know, you know, uh, have a very clear answer. So we are in this uh, a bit of a predicament when it comes to that. And the research ethics board, who usually provide the approval uh, for these research projects, don't really make that uh, delineation correctly. Uh, some of the issues as well, a lot of these applications are, you know, have what we call an ongoing uh, processing system. And, and, you know, looking at the most recent legislation, how do you justify these ongoing processing? Uh, how can AI laws adapt to uh, detect bias? And we've heard that, you know, some of the more recent legislation uh, are, are, are interested in, in that particular point, but how will that be done in practice? How will it be binding? How would uh, the innovators uh, be able to do that? That's that's another question. I'm also very interested in the concept of explainability uh, as well, and some of the limitations regarding that. Uh, so this is another issue that um, we've been facing. Um, you know, you talk to the uh, regulators and you talk to the legislators and they're interested in you know, showcasing that we we're doing something about this. Um, and then you talk to the innovators themselves and they say, well, you know, there are some limitations for us being able to do that. Um, I talked about genetic information and how can it really be identified, but there's also other issues, including how do commercial entities fit in all of this, right? Um, this is information, this is data. As you'll see from the Genomic App Atlas, most of these applications were created for consumer uh, based technology and therefore these are commercial entities that have a very clear business model. Um, so how do they fit in all of this? And um, applications, you know, um, can they be actually regulated as medical devices? Uh, in Canada, we had recent guidance uh, for software as medical uh, devices. With all the difficulties that, that we've heard uh, in terms of, of its actual application, um, and yes, it's true. Sometimes when we contact um, our, our, our the body uh, responsible for that, we don't necessarily get the answers, especially if you ask them to write it. Uh, but but um, some of the issues that we have is is you know a lot of these applications are considered as it's not being risky enough for them to actually be regulated, and uh, this is a cause of concern uh, because of the nature of the data that is being collected, the data that's being uploaded, the data that's being shared. So we worked on, on this genomic app atlas. Um, so the idea here is, is to document how consumer health apps uh, use health data. Uh, we've analyzed around 18 uh, genomic apps that are available in Canada and appear to engage in what we call data crowdsourcing. Um, all the analyzed apps primarily collect data for a purpose other than research, but, but the, where research is also an additional uh, component. Um, six out of the 18 uh, applications are associated with DTC, so direct-to-consumer uh, genetic testing services. Nine out of the 18, so almost half, are platforms to which app users upload their genetic testing results uh, that are obtained elsewhere. And three out of the 18 are algorithm-based platforms. So the, the users upload non-genetic information with which the app then makes genetic inferences. Uh, by looking at the privacy policies, uh, so they all differ in, in their format and in their language. Uh, as you'll see, um, you know, in a few seconds, uh, you know, when we talk about the privacy policies, we're actually happy to see that there is actually a big number of them that do actually have privacy policies compared to five years, 10 years ago. Uh, but but it doesn't mean that they're clear. It doesn't mean that they're uh, not ambiguous. Or, or so some of the policies have, for example, very clear short paragraphs that are that are you know that are sometimes with titles, but other use complex languages and formats. Uh, and the disclosure of data sharing uh, are not always in the same subsection. This is a an example. This is called DNA fit. Um, so here. 
uh, for example, uh, there is an, an aspect uh, around research and development, but then you can look from the actual wording that it's open, unclear. Uh, we may process your information if you have pro provided prior express and voluntary consent. Um, you know, this, this processing may include sharing your information with contracted suppliers. Uh, we assure you that your information is not sold to any third parties for any other purposes. Um, there's a lot of maze in, in this, in this policy itself. Um, it's really unclear exactly how this will be done, uh, in practice and, and especially who will have, uh, the, the adjudication powers when it comes to access of this information. This is another example here. Uh, they do talk about research, right? So they, they say this is going to contribute to science by, by joining patient registries in rare disease research. But then when you look at the privacy, then app, uh, there is no details provided in terms of their privacy practices. Um, and, and yeah, there's, you know, it's not always the case that there is uh, uh, something that's meaningful. Most of the times, if there isn't one for the particular app, they sometimes send you to a very generic uh, privacy policy for the developer. Uh, this is another example of perhaps a little bit more what these should look like, right? Because they're, 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 um, there's an outline and there's, there are sections, there are paragraphs. Um, you know, these are examples of, you know, um, really hard to find details uh, that are sometimes buried within these privacy policies that, by the way, not a lot of people read. Uh, when you download this application uh, or an application, people are just impatient to get it on their phone and they'll, you'll get all the notifications in the world, but how many of us actually take the time to read through the agreements, read through the privacy policies? So, as I was saying, you know, this, this number is actually a high number compared to earlier research that was done in this field. 83% of the apps that we've seen uh, have privacy policies. And our hypothesis here is because many of these apps, um, you know, are uh, apps that were used for consumer purposes. And, and this has been a field uh, that, that has, you know, a lot of work uh, done uh, over the past, you know, uh, decade. So it is normal that you'll see a little bit more uh, policies um, in this field than others. Uh, 14 out of the 15 um, privacy policies are app specific and one of them uh, was more related to the developer. So we wanted to look at, and these are early results, but we want to look at their data sharing practices. And so 47 of the privacy policies contain contradictory or ambiguous language surrounding data sharing. Um, you know, the, and, and, and sometimes very vague, very open. Your personal data may be used or disclosed if we believe that such disclosure is reasonably necessary. I mean, you can fit everything in there, right? 40% uh, of privacy policies require participants give explicit additional consent to share their data, only 40%, right? Um, this is an example. Uh, this is called My Gene Rank. The goal of the study is to determine how your genetic risk influences health decisions and other things that could be controlled in life. Well, that's a big, big statement. Our first genetic risk score is calculated for coronary artery disease. This is how it actually looks like on the application itself. Um, and kudos. I mean, they, they, these are very user friendly, um, you know, and, and if you want to learn more, you would click Again, if you have the time and have the patience, you would click on those links and you get a little bit more information. And because I had time and interest, I did that. And then you'll see here the, the contradiction within the same document, right? So we will not share your genetic data. And then a little bit later, the genetic and health information may be shared with other researchers for future research, right? And forget about anything related to any form of information of how this is done, where it's gonna be, uh, stored, who's going to have access to it, what are the you know, conditions for that, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, only eight out of the 15 uh, uh, privacy policies explicitly mention genetic data, right? They're there for genetic information, but only 53% do. 20% um, of privacy policy explicitly mentioned that shared data may be used in research, right? So this is even worse in the, in the sense that You'll, you see in the very general description, something about research, but if you look at the privacy policy, only 20% of them actually do talk about that. Um, 
Only two uh, out of the 15 uh, privacy policy describe security safeguards uh, for shared data. And uh, what's was more, you know, a bit scarier for us was that, you know, because of the, the apps we that we reviewed initially collected data for non-research purposes, none of the apps obtained formal consent for research. So as you can imagine, it does create a lot of the legal and ethical issues here. Um, there is, you know, of course, a lot of ambiguity uh, about how the user's data can be used and shared, uh, and this raises significant uh, concerns. Um, user information may be used in ways to which they have not consented, right? It doesn't mean that they have initially consented, so they could actually not have consented at all. It may be shared with entities that do not take appropriate safeguards, and it may be used to make unexpected inferences or to engage in genetic discrimination. And, and so thinking about, th there are unique challenges related to mobile crowdsourcing uh, that, that are different from other types of apps that are doing research and also other um, just more generally genomic research uh, that's being done. And, and uh, we divided them into four categories. So in terms of the data sources, uh, often uh, these are done through uh, DTC testing rather than self-reported. So there's a lot of issues related to validity and reliability of the information. The data significance itself, you know, it does touch on more areas of an individual's life. Um, and it depends on how this information is being shared and with whom uh, this could have an effect on, uh, on, on people's decision making. The quality, right? Uh, potentially more difficult to control uh, the quality of the data in the crowdsource uh, uh, database. And in terms of the regulatory requirements, it's really difficult for us to actually verify uh, consent standards and sharing, particularly when data is collected for uh, a different purpose. And so thinking about this moving forward, um, and this is done through a, collab a research project that's in collaboration between Quebec and Flanders in Belgium. So in this kind of evolution of our thoughts, you know, what are the next steps uh, for us? And, and, you know, we thought that one of the most important things to do at the beginning, and this is why we've done the, the app atlas, is to identify and categorize these applications. Uh, we've had a, 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 rec a, a, um, a recent publication done on um, symptom checker apps. And, and just use of the term mHealth or mobile health, um, this, this has been a, quite an issue because they're used uniformly and, and nobody actually understands the differences. Um, and then, you know, one of our uh, main, uh, I would say, result that came out of this is that some of those are not just about tracking and telling you, you know, how many steps you've made during the day, but some of them are actually playing doctor, uh, even though they say clearly that they're not. Uh, but they are actually making inferences in terms of uh, based on your symptoms and providing you with possible conditions. Um, so identifying and categorizing the apps is a very important first steps. Um, we've done, you know, the, the, the now legal analysis uh, in terms of the norms, uh, but we really want to be able to uh, also do an empirical study. And this has started actually with our colleagues in Belgium um with app developers and with users and this this is how you know we might be able to to develop uh, some policy recommendations but our goal is not just to have something that you know yes of course gets published but we also want to create tools um you know in, in the form of checklists for developers and the form of checklists for users that are using these applications and um you know Thinking about it from a regulatory perspective, you know, is is of course always important. But at the same time, we have to think about the users and their own experience, right? Because at the end of the day, this is going to be much quicker, and it's and it's a direct connection than uh, policy or guidance that comes from above. Um, you know, I'll give you an example uh, in. 2015, um, you know, so we've had this issue in terms of using applications or apps for research purposes. And um, one of the issues is, well, it's available on the platform, but has it received REB approval? And there is actually no way of finding that out, uh, but, but uh, through discussions, through pressure, 
uh, Apple decided to add that to their developers agreement. And that had much more power than an actual guidance or a policy because at the end of the day, this was a um, direct uh, link between those that are interested in creating them and putting them on the online platform. Um, even though there are some very clear regulation in terms of REB approval for research uh, purposes. And, and it basically the developer's agreement now says if you're doing research, uh, you need this approval before your application uh, is available on the platform. So regulation, yes, uh, but there's also you know, the possibility of having professional uh, association guidance, uh, especially for uh, clinical research uh, that's being done using these applications. Um, REBs have a role to play as well. We, we keep talking about you know, their importance and, and approvals, but there's a, a lack of uh, training um in 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 reviewing these uh um, you know specific applications consumer protection is an interesting aspect in the united states this has been um used uh, many of these applications are are you know initially for consumer uh bases so so that that could be a, a move forward education of course um but you know there is this term that we use uh lot lc so the ethical legal and social issues but uh, i think psychology needs to be added to it uh, in terms of our understanding because this is how individuals make choices um, uh, make decisions related to their use of these technologies and having a bit of an understanding on that as well will be a very good complement uh, for for our analysis so thank you very much happy to Thank you so much, Brian. Um, brilliant presentation. So we are going to break for lunch. Uh, so uh, for those who are joining us online, we will go off live stream.